start. Well, again, everybody, this is our last class. Uh, we won't have but one class this week. And this one is given to a uh, review in preparation for the final. And I want to do three things at the start. Uh, I want to let you know uh, what this is going to be today, this class. Uh, I, I want to be careful this class not to try to do too much uh, here at the end. Uh, I'm not going to repeat a lot of what I said already. There's no reason to do that, nor is there time to do it. Uh, what I want to try to do is, is as according to the word review, uh, I want to pay, take another look at, I want to review what we've been talking about since the, uh, since the online classes uh, started. Uh, but I don't want to do too much with that either. I, I want to do just enough to get get us all on the same page here going into the into the final exam. The format, the second thing is the format of the, the final exam. Uh, there'll be three questions, uh, one each on the three periods that we're going to cover in the final exam. There'll be a Reformation question, there'll be a Scientific Revolution question, and there'll be a Glorious Revolution question. Those are the three areas that we're going to uh, concentrate on for the final. We're not doing anything with the late Middle Ages or the voyages of exploration and discovery. We're not doing anything with the Renaissance. It's the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, the Glorious uh, Revolution. And I want to look at those again uh, today without repeating anything or adding too much to what you already have. Third thing I want to do is to uh, suggest how you should prepare for it. Uh, you, you've been preparing since classes went online. Uh, the way to do this is to look at the questions that you've done for the assignments, uh, see what's good there, see from my comments what needs to be better, make sure you get them better so that you can take on uh, the different questions that you'll see on those three topics uh, come final exam time. What I want to do is get you the final exam by the end of the week uh, and have you turn, have you all turn that into me uh, by noon on uh, Monday. Uh, there's nothing coming in noon tomorrow. This is Sunday. There's nothing coming in noon tomorrow. There's no assignment for tomorrow. The next assignment's the last assignment, the final exam. So those are the three periods that we've, that, that we're going to uh, talk about. The, the, the Reformation, the glorious, the scientific, let me start that again. The Reformation, the scientific revolution, and the glorious revolution. I want to look at some differences between those periods, between them and uh, within them. Uh, in one way, the second of the three, the scientific revolution, stands alone. Uh, in its own time, it affected hardly anybody. Uh, you could have been alive at the time and not had any idea in the world that there was a revolution in science going on. And you remember what I said about Newton's book, The Principles in 1687. It, it's been estimated that that great earth-changing, science-changing book, there weren't but 12 people on the planet in 1687 who could read that with any degree of understanding at all. It was written in Latin and it was largely a matter of calculus. And who's going to read that? Who can read that? Uh, still, it had an enormous impact in the future. Another different way to look at the three is to see uh, how the first of them, the Reformation, stands apart from the second and the third. And the way the Reformation stands apart is in the matter of where it drew its inspiration from and what the Reformation wanted to accomplish. For the moment, when I say Reformation, I mean Martin Luther and the Christian humanists. They drew their inspiration from the past, from the great days of the church in the early days of the church between the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection on down to when Constantine legalized the church 
And then the church went on to save civilization from the wave of barbarism coming into, into Europe. The Reformation, Christian humanists and the Reformation, were all about the past. They wanted to restore a long gone, vanished past. It began with a protest against the sale of indulgences. I tried to explain that the sale of indulgences was like the tip of an iceberg. It's the part of the dangerous iceberg you see, but it's not the part that hurts you. The part that hurts you is what beneath, it's what beneath is beneath the surface. Luther wanted to restore the church to what it had once been. He did not want to split the church. He was afraid of that happening, and he didn't want to be responsible for it. But he made his protest against the sale of indulgences, and that protest took on a life of its own uh, and, and led to a final and fatal split in, in, in Christianity. Remember, from the very beginning to Luther's time, there's been one kind of Christianity, and that's Catholic Christianity. It's been the only kind. The church has been united. That's all now fixing to change. Uh, the, the, the church hit that part of the iceberg it couldn't see. If, if it was just a matter of indulgences, Luther could have said, they're immoral, they're, they're this, they're that, they're the other thing, all bad. If that had been the extent of it, the church would have said what it did in fact say later in the Council of Trent. The church said, you're right, Martin Luther, that was a bad practice going on, and we regret it, and we're taking steps to make sure that nothing like it ever happens again. You've heard those kind of words uh, before. Uh, in addition to protesting about indulgences, Luther protested against the doctrine or the teaching or the theology of the church that said selling indulgences is okay after all. Luther went out after that theology. That theology, he said, is based on the incorrect idea from a misreading of scripture that a man is saved in part by faith, but also in part by the good deeds he does, that a man can act on his own behalf. And because a man can act on his own behalf, Luther said, he's going to do anything and everything possible to act in the right way and act doing nothing the right thing. And it's real easy, Luther said, for people to fall into the indulgence trap. It's not the indulgence itself, it's the thinking that leads into believing that that's going to be a good thing for you and affect your chances of life after death, keep you out of hell, in other words. Well, the church said that salvation is a combination of good deeds and faith, and that faith is based on tradition and on scripture. Luther said, wrong again. Salvation is based on faith alone, not good works. And where that comes from is not from tradition and scripture. It comes from scripture alone. And with that line in the sand that Luther drew, certainly by 1520, three years into it, that's becoming more and more obvious that this is not just about the sale of indulgences, that, that crooked business. It, it, it's about the theology that lay behind that. Well, it was obvious that uh, they both couldn't be right. Uh, and that got obvious, more and more obvious as, as the Reformation went on. The, the, the way to study the Reformation, looking back, reviewing it, is to see the, the different ways and things in the different ways in which things were changing as a result of Luther's explosion against indulgences in 1517. Luther brought about a great change in the teaching of the church. The second generation of Protestantism, John Calvin's wave of Protestantism, the Puritan wave of Protestantism, went a step further and explained to Christians that Luther is wrong when he insists on obedience to all authority, 
God is pleased when faithful Protestants take up arms against a faithless Catholic ruler or society. And that opened up the whole political aspect of the uh, Reformation. Because the heads of state at that time, because the heads of state, the rulers, the kings, the queens, whatever, they were, in addition to being heads of state, they were the heads of the church. And so any controversy almost automatically becomes political and then military in nature. And then you have the Catholic Reformation thrown in, where the church says, the old church says, we are coming back. We too are going to restore the past, but we're going to do it our way, and you're going to do it our way as well, uh, because it's the only way, and there's no compromise. You all make up your minds between our way and the protesters' way. Truth is going to prevail, and Protestants say and believe the same thing. So it's very obvious by the time you get to the 1550s and 1560s that they can't both be right. But now here comes the first stirrings, the first voices of, of the scientific revolution. Luther's kickoff was 1517. The scientific revolution kicked off in 1543 with the publication of two very important works, Copernicus remapping, or at least replacing at the center of what we took to be the universe, replacing the sun, I'm sorry, replacing the earth with the sun, and Vesalius, the great student of anatomy, uh, publishing a, a whole new map of the human body, so to speak, uh, a, a revolution in anatomy. Uh, in 1543. And what you get from 1543 for the next 135, 40 years is called this scientific revolution. And what that revolution consists of is the scientific community, I use that phrase, uh, the scientific community looking at evidence, uncovering evidence, pro Copernicus or against Copernicus acting as a jury, so to speak, rendering a verdict, so to speak, is Copernicus right or is Copernicus wrong? Is the universe earth-centered, as the old church had said, as the Greeks had said, as the Romans had said, or is it sun-centered, as Copernicus uh, is, uh, now, it, it is now saying? So the standard of evidence, the standard of proof that the scientific revolution goes by is, is, is science and experiment, I'm sorry, is math and or experiment. And that's a completely different standard of truth than the quarrel between the Protestant church and the Catholic church. In the Protestant Catholic controversy, truth is determined by faith. You are right or you are wrong in all things depending upon your faith. That's, that's not the scientific way at all. Now there's a new standard of truth and science can say to the Reformation, so to speak, you're right, Luther and the old church can't both be right. But we can say, here in the midst of the scientific revolution, we can say that you both can be wrong wrong in the sense that you're measuring truth the wrong way. And if you're both wrong, then you're becoming increasingly irrelevant to life here in the modernizing 16, uh, 16 15 and into the 1600s. Uh, That's the revolutionary change that the scientific revolution uh, brings about. It measures truth in a different way. Evidence is not theological. Evidence is not in good deeds or good works. Evidence is the result of experiment of math. It's a completely new standard uh, of, uh, of truth. And it, it's, it, it's the difference between medieval, on the one hand, and early modern, on the uh, other hand. In looking at the Reformation, I, I wanted you to know about 
Calvin and the second generation of Protestantism and how that changed things, political and military resistance. Here in the scientific revolution, I want you to know about the new evidence that is coming pouring in now as far as Copernicus's accuracy uh, is, is concerned. Not, not that many people knew about it, hardly any people, any people knew about it at all. But the jury, so to speak, or the scientific community is being flooded with evidence coming in, proving in this way, that way, the other way, that in all likelihood Copernicus is right and that we've had the structure of the universe upside, inside out, so to speak, that it's earth-centered and not uh, sun-centered. Or I, might, I may have got that backwards again. Uh, Copernicus wants the sun to be the center and the evidence is coming in in great waves that he is, by the new standard of truth, science, math and experiment right. I want you to know the nature of that evidence that's coming in. What Kepler added by way of evidence in favor of Copernicus. What Galileo added as evidence in favor of Copernicus. Even though Galileo went back on What Isaac Newton added on his own. At, Newton was the great synthesizer, uh, but he added new evidence uh, as well, uh, chiefly the, the mathematical science of, of, of calculus. Uh, that seemed to disprove the old Earth-centered universe and give a lot of credence to what Copernicus had been, had been saying. Again, not that anybody knew or cared, uh, the scientific revolution was unlike the Reformation in that way, and it was certainly also unlike the revolution to follow, uh, or, or to run neck and neck, really, and, and that, is the, uh, that is the glorious uh, revolution. I don't think it's an, a coincidence at all. Well, let, let's look at the starting date of the glorious revolution. I, I take that to be 16.3. It, like the scientific revolution, is a long process. And the Glorious Revolution began in 1603, I think, when James I came to the throne, and it ended in 1688, when James II uh, was deposed from the throne. At the end, I don't think it's a coincidence at all that the two revolutions came to an end within a year of each other. Uh, the date of Isaac Newton's principles is 1687. King James II was deposed in 1688. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that the man who wrapped up the Glorious Revolution, John Locke, was a reader of and good friend of the man who wrapped up the Scientific Revolution, Isaac Newton. John Locke, who interpreted all of the events of the Glorious Revolution, for the English-speaking world, uh, believed that the results of the Glorious Revolution were just as important as the results of the Scientific Revolution and needed to be made a lot more known than the level of education would allow for large numbers of people to be conversant in, in science. Uh, I wanted you to know the events of the Glorious Revolution, just as I wanted you to know the, the chief contributors to the scientific revolution along the way. The events of the Glorious Revolution on the way are, are fascinating, uh, they're tragic. Think of the trial and the execution of, of the king. And I thought that the best way to keep track of what's going on in the Glorious Revolution is to chart it in terms of the successive reigns of the kings uh, who are involved uh, in it. Uh, again, not to know the birth and death dates of, of these four kings in the 17th century, but to know the sequence in which they appear and the difference in events un in the time of their reign, I think 
is a great clarifier for uh, what was what was going on. James the first, Charles the first, Charles the second, James the second. It's not that it's not that hard a pattern to remember. In the middle, between the first two and the second two, there is that interregnum where there is no king. Where Charles I has been executed, Parliament will have nothing to do with monarchy at that point, the Puritans especially, and there is no king for a is no king for a, for a decade. The standard of truth in the Reformation was faith. The standard of truth in the scientific revolution was science and math, or evidence, as uncovered by the scientific method. The standard of truth in the glorious revolution was parliament as the representative body, the oldest representative body in the English-speaking world. At the time, it represented hardly anyone don't think of it as a democratic assembly at all. It represented two kinds of people, uh, aristocrats old land and very wealthy commoners uh, new money. But at least it was representative, at least it answered to public opinion. And the new standard of truth for the glorious revolution comes to be popular consent or public approval. As, exp as expressed in voting for members of parliament, as we vote for members of the Senate and the House of uh, Representatives. That becomes the standard now by which uh, truth is, is measured. The scientific revolution had no respect for the past, unlike Luther, unlike the old church. The scientific revolution wanted to do away with the science of the past and replace it with evidence as gathered by the scientific evidence. The glorious revolution had no respect for the past. It wanted a new standard of political and civil life, not determined by the divine right of change. Together, uh, these are the, these are the great changes that, that take us out of medieval time and into not quite yet modern time. Early, early modern time. In the next century, our course doesn't go there because we're done now. Um, in the next century, the leading figures as far as opinion makers, the difference makers. By that time, the whole climate has, has changed. I don't mean the meteorological climate, I, I mean the climate of opinion or the, or the, the, the framework in which we, we look at life. By, by the 1700s, just 13 years after Newton, nobody could seriously believe any longer, just couldn't, that a king ruled at God's pleasure, that answered only to God, and that bishops the same way, that bishops if a bishop was appointed by a particular king, it's because that king was appointed by God and the bishop appointed from God through the king. Uh, couldn't believe that any longer and consider yourself an educated man. Uh, the climate had changed, the intellectual climate had changed. And the other thing, another example uh, was witchcraft. That, that sounds like something off the wall, something fringe, but it wasn't. It, witches were hunted down mercilessly in the 1500s and into the 1600s uh, as well and not just in old England or the old world either but in Massachusetts and New England uh, as, uh, as well but you couldn't any longer after Isaac Newton call yourself educated and think that witches 
needed to be identified, convicted, tortured, and drowned. That had just become a thing of the of the past. Not that Newton said anything about witches, he never even mentioned them. Or divine right of kings either. It didn't, it didn't even come occur to Newton that anything like that be worth anything like that would be worth mentioning. It just was not conceivable anymore. If we had been able uh, to keep our 1,000 words folder going through the semester, as I sincerely hoped uh, we would be able to, uh, you may remember what the first picture in that folder was. The first picture in that folder was uh, an Egyptian water wheel. No water, no civilization. No water wheel, no water to the fields, no confidence, no civilization. Well, that would be the first picture in the, in the folder. It was the first picture. I think the last, if we were still running that folder, I, I really wish we were, wish we could have. I think the last would be a picture that symbolized the great change that's come about now as a result of these, of the three, the Reformation, Scientific Revolution, and the Glorious Revolution. I think the picture that would symbolize that best would be uh, Charles, Charles I uh, facing his executioner on that day the end of January 1649. Long about the middle of the semester, well, I wanted to say one thing about the last, last semester. When you're studying the Reformation, don't forget the Christian humanists. Don't forget Thomas More. Don't forget Erasmus, because they're almost part of the Reformation. They had such a big influence on Luther. And in the last assignment, Terry did real good to point out how important Thomas More uh, was. And I, I, I urged her to put, put Erasmus in that category too and, and, and know specifically what, what Erasmus did. We got a lot of contributions from y'all during the semester. Uh, I remember in the middle, somewhere in the middle of the first half of the course, uh, we were talking about possible titles for that uh, 1,000 words folder that we, that we had. And Emily uh, said that she, she titled her uh, notebook, uh, Our Story. I, I, thought that was a great, I thought that was a great title. It's been a great story. Uh, great stories are hard to break. Uh, great stories you want to keep turning the page or, or, or listening uh, to the storyteller, but it has to break off somewhere. College course, and our transition from medieval into the early modern period is as good a break as any. Make sure that you uh, get any questions you have in terms of preparation to me uh, by way of email. Uh, I'm always ready to. I'm always ready to answer. Uh, I was glad to. Uh, answer. Uh, as I say, you'll get the final exam uh, end of the week, and it'll be due uh, Monday noon. That would be May 7, I think is the correct date. Uh, that would be the date for the final exam. It's, it's due by. You'll, have your, you'll have your grade in very short order. Uh, I think we're all set.